42 of the Progression Love Podcast. I'm here with Caroline Milne. Caroline, do you want to introduce yourself to everybody? I will. Uh, hi, I'm Caroline. I am an online coach. I'm based in Scotland at the moment, although we've just been chatting. I'm actually moving to uh, moving to the big smoke. I'm moving back to London in a week's time. Um, I am an online coach. I specialize in working with professional women, busy, busy women, women who want to upgrade their lifestyles and they want to get the very very best out of every aspect of those lifestyles very good so you just mentioned off air that you're moving from uh Aber- no it's dundee i keep on thinking dundee. <laughs> dundee to london so um what are your plans in, in in london what um will london allow you to do with your work with with uh the professional women that you can't do where do you know what it's actually it sounds really really selfish it's not a career decision as such it's more a personal one and I'm very much with clients and you'll be the same but it's very much a a practice what you preach mentality that I have with with my clients and I really believe that environment is a huge a huge aspect uh, that makes us who we are and allows us to progress and whether you define environment as as actual space, location, whether you define environment as the people who are surrounding you, um, the conversations that you're having, the things that you're reading, you're listening to, I think all of that just plays such a huge, huge, huge role in, in how we perform personally, professionally. And for me, it's time for a new chapter. It's time for a new challenge, for a change. And that's really the move. So it, it's not as much as it will be wonderful to network more, to be in a bigger city, to have resources. It's actually more of a personal thing um, for, for growth and to allow me to expand horizons. You're preaching to the choir here, me living in San Francisco. It's always great, but I just wanted personally something different. So uh, just tell me a little bit about your work that you, you specialize. So like what what are the typical challenges that like uh, that women face, um, like, you know, uh, in terms of managing their health um, and just being working professionals or whatever their kind of the challenges? Yeah, um, I'll probably go back to maybe just a little bit about where I uh, have come from and how I've arrived at what I do. My background was in architecture. So I have an architecture degree from the Glasgow School of Art. I've worked in firms in London previously, Vancouver, um, in Glasgow. And when I was working in practice, it's a very, very difficult, it's it's very difficult to juggle your professional and personal, personal goals, particularly for women. We have this attitude whereby we want, we want that, that balance, that elusive balance in our life. We are juggling hundreds of plates at any given time. And I don't, I know I don't have children at this point in my life. And the, and the women that I work with generally do, they have even more um, to, to juggle than I ever did. But my background is in, in the corporate world and it has given me this insight into the pressures that women are under, that they put themselves under a lot of the time um, to try and have it all. And the challenges that they face, I mean, typical ones that we see are lack of time. It's low energy. It's feeling as though you aren't giving everything that you have to all of these components, whether it be to to colleagues, to partners, to family members, to friends. You're wearing all of these different hats at any given time. And an awful lot of women feel like they are not showing up the way that they want to in any of these areas. And what will always happen with ladies, and maybe some of your, your listeners, this will resonate with them, but when you are juggling so many things, you, you tend to put your own needs right at the bottom of that. I call it a pyramid of priority. So if you imagine it like an upside down pyramid where everyone else is, is above you and you are at the bottom of this of this pyramid and you're never putting yourself first and your goals get put on the back burner and you always think, you know, I could wear that, that dress or I wish I could feel confident here or I wish I, you know, looked like I did 10 years ago. All of those goals get put on the back burner because you have all of these, these other aspects. And, you know, with women, it's it's always going to be challenging for men, of course, but I, um, I see it from a female perspective in that we do try and do it all. So when ladies come to me, they're often in a point where they don't know what to do. It's gone so far that they just do not know now 
how to get out of it, where to start. The Progression Health Podcast has teamed up with TRX. So TRX is a bodyweight training piece of equipment that you can hook up anywhere, anytime. And uh, I highly recommend it. I use it in every session with my clients. I use it to warm up and also for stretching. Uh, but if you are traveling, which is where I recommend everyone use it, you know, it's hard to get to a gym. Uh, it's hard to find the time. But you could literally work out from your hotel room with the TRX um, and the door attachment that it has where it doesn't damage the door, but it gives you an effective workout. I also like to add in other things like uh, glute bands and uh, resistance bands uh, but once you have the trx then you can figure all that out so get yourself 50 percent off on the trx home workout equipment with the code progression health trx and boost your workout effectiveness and consistency progression health podcast is brought to you by better help better help is an online therapy service which will help you to more effectively manage your mental health mental health is very important and it's something that all of us are realizing now especially after the pandemic during the pandemic for me especially it was very challenging and i, I reached out to better help i uh, tried out a few of their licenses therapist settled on one for the majority of the pandemic and i found uh, the help that i received invaluable and the great thing also is that you can speak to your therapist outside of sessions um, if it's not working out you can switch very affordable it's really easy to use also um, and if someone hasn't tried therapy before but you're kind of you know you're curious i would highly recommend better help so what we've done is uh we've got a sign up link i'll attach in the show notes and basically you can get a discount to get started and uh, start improving your mental health today so better help for better mental health start and this is where we come in and we do essentially what I would consider a, a life audit, where we really look at, right, what is going on with you? What are your main stressors? How are you sleeping? How are you, you know, how's your digestion? How are you, your, your hormone profile? We look at everything it together uh, because your life is a, a tapestry of components. And I think it's very naive of, of fitness professionals to come in and think that describing someone five sessions a week and a diet of chicken, broccoli and rice is going to solve all their problems because it simply won't. And the way that I think having the background in, in the corporate world has equipped me to do is to speak to these women on the level that they're used to, to conversing in. And really, you know, we understand, myself and my team all have professional backgrounds. So one is a pharmacist, one is a, a scientist. We all know what it's like to have career pressures. You know, what happens when that meeting runs over? What happens when you get a deadline thrown at you and you have to work till X time in the evening? What happens when someone suggests a dinner out with a client? You know, all of these are real and very tangible barriers for women to have to navigate. And this is why where we, we approach it in a, I would hope, a very different way to conventional online coaching. Very good. Yeah, you've got the kind of the experience and the expertise, which is a really nice mix. I think it's the best way to have things. So I, I, I had a coach before. So shout out to, to Tyler Yasuda. He told me before that a lot of people would say, oh, you know, I have to choose this kind of uh, one or the other type of thing, you know, maybe career or health. Whereas he was like, why not try and be the best you can be in all areas you're, you're, you're working on? You know, obviously you could periodize things like you would with your training and focus more at different times, but you still have that idea that like I can make little incremental progress across the board. Um, do you think that it's possible to improve in many different areas or as a working professional as like your clients are is it an either or type of thing but like if they come to work with you does it mean that like their career you know maybe they kind of just maintain the progress they're making in their career and they prioritize their health or you know how does it work with prioritizing different areas of their life when they have so much going on brilliant question. and you know what i think it's one of the narratives that people tell themselves and one of the excuses that is given not to start making changes to their to their health and fitness journey um, the way that I would, the way that I would respond to that would be to say, think of if you were the very, very best version of you. Think if you were someone who jumped out of bed in the morning and couldn't wait to get to work. Think of if you were someone who you didn't have that fatigue that you have pre cup of coffee. You were driven. You were motivated. You were switched on. You were energized. You were productive. Think about that version of you. That version of you is going to show up in the best possible way in all areas. You're going to show up better at work. You're going to show up better in your relationships. Other people are going to thrive off that energy that you're that you're bringing to the table. You're going to excel in work because your productivity has increased. All of those things happen from investing in your health and fitness journey. So if you are making improvements to yourself, you are going to enhance those other areas. You're not taking away from them because you're bringing 
bringing more to the table. So if you're working on you, it's that whole ethos of put your own mask on first. You know that thing they say on planes, put your own mask on first before helping other people. You cannot pour from an empty cup. You can't. And particularly with women, we are trying to fill everyone else's cups all of the time. Yours is my priority. And what ladies have to understand is that investing in themselves, also making an investment in their families, in their careers. It's a ripple effect. It's not an all or nothing situation. It's it's a complete. I was on a podcast the other day and she described it as the halo effect, which I absolutely loved. It's this whole thing of when you glow, other people notice it and they also, they can take in that energy from you. I absolutely love that image. Very good. Yeah. I, I like the quote you have of like investing in yourself, you know, it like it carries over to other areas. So um, it's not, it's not an either or, you know, if you invest in your health, it'll, it'll pay off down the line in your career or, you know, in your relationships because you'll have more energy for those. So just with your clients and your specialty of working with uh, women, what are like the unique challenges? You know, I'm just basically asking as like a naive man, you know, unaware, <laughs> uninformed, what uh, are some of the unique challenges that women face that you are? I would say the, the most common ones or are, most common, yeah. yeah, the most common ones without a shadow of a doubt is the time press. So a lot of women will say they simply do not have, you don't not have time. You're just not using your time effect. Time management is poor. It's not that you don't have it. And I'm not being, um, you know, I'm not sitting on my high horse saying, you know, what's that phrase? It's like, we all have the same hours in the day as Beyonce. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we just have to be more efficient with our time. Time. And sometimes that's a case of saying no to certain things. And it's being very, very clear on, right, what is your goal at any given time? And what actions are you, where are you spending your time during the day that is either working towards that goal or taking away from it? How can we streamline your day to be more effective? How can we make things easier for you? How can we delegate if need be? How can we be smarter with your day? A lot of the things that I'll do with ladies are actually not to do with necessarily with training and nutrition per se, actually looking at time management, actually designing their week actually looking at and it, architecture is a lot of problem solving it's there's never a it's never a blank canvas it's always working with regulations it's always a how can we problem solve you know a, a site or access or sizes of rooms etc 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 my brain works in a very problem solving in a way we'll always always try and find a solution and I design ladies weeks in a similar way as we look at, right, this is the time we have available. How effective can we be with that? How can we best utilize what you do have? And um, sometimes that's the case saying no to things and um, and streamlining. So time is definitely, um, definitely one. Another one is without a shadow of a doubt is a lot of self-belief. Uh, a lot of women do not believe that they can make long lasting change. They do not fundamentally believe that they can have a body composition that they're happy with. They can't, they don't believe that they will ever have improved relationships with food or they will, you know, be able to go to a restaurant and, and order what they fancy without guilt the next day. And a lot of that comes from poor traditional mentalities around dieting. So if you are someone who by the age of 40, 45, you've never successfully lost weight and been able to, to keep it off. If you've been in a constant roller coaster of yo-yo dieting, gaining weight, losing weight, gaining weight, if you, why would you believe that you could make that lasting change? So there's a lot of self-limiting beliefs that we face when women come to us initially that we spend time breaking and that we spend time working through and finding long-term solutions. The ultimate goal for a client is long-term maintenance and, and freedom surrounding food choice. And that's what we, that we hear our program and we walk clients, clients through that process. And the last one actually is not knowledge. Um, we are we have more conviction around our decisions when we understand the basis in which we're making them. Knowledge is power when it comes to fat loss. I say fat loss is a bit like driving. So if you have, you know, if you drive, you don't drive a car now with a driving instructor next to you. It's simply not the way that it works. Once you've learned to drive a car, you can drive a car. There's no need for that instructor to be with you. Fat loss is the same. When we equip you with the tools, we equip you with the principles. You no longer need it. I don't want to work with clients for longer than five, six months. You should have learned the tools that you need to equip you for life. Otherwise, I've not done my job correct. So when ladies come on board with us, knowledge, 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 education, let's fill the gap. The reason that you have not succeeded in fat loss previously is not because you weren't able to do it. It's because you didn't have the support, you didn't have the knowledge, and you didn't have the reassurance along the way. And this is where we make, this is where we come in and we change. Brilliant. So, so you mentioned saying no. I think I even find it difficult to say no, but it's quite refreshing when you're actually like, you know what, I'm going to pass on this because of, you know, I've got something else going on or it just doesn't connect with what I value. Uh, what are like some typical things that, that women specifically would have to say no to? And then I'd imagine you're saying no because there's something else you're saying yes to. Like, so, you know, I'm not going to uh, maybe go out on the weekend because I value my sleep. I'm saying yes to sleep. I'm saying no to socializing, you know, that affects my sleep. So could you give me some examples of kind of no's and, 
and yes, is that would be more aligned with uh, the clients uh, that you have? Yeah, absolutely. I think one thing I will say is about the, the socializing. I think there's a bit of a misconception that in order to achieve goals, I must remove everything that is pleasurable about, about my life. And I say to ladies from the get go, I say, imagine I said for the next six months, Sandra, let's call her Sandra. Sandra, for the next six months, you're not allowed to drink wine. You're not allowed to go out for dinner. You're not allowed to go for coffee with your friend. You're not allowed to go for date night with your husband. Lunch with the kids is off the table. All of these things for the next six months, none of those. Do you, do you think Sandra would sign up to a program like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Or she wouldn't. I never ask ladies to remove things that make, the, why are we doing this? We are doing this to live happy and fulfilled life and to be happy in ourselves. I think accomplishment in your own achievements is, it's, it's a huge drive. Um, we're never asking women to give anything up. What we are asking them to do is very often to say yes to their goals and say yes to the things that make life worth living. And a good example of that would be, yeah, I mean, we used to have in the office, we used to have a Wednesday wine club. This was genuinely a thing. Now, my tender 22-year-old self would go to Wednesday wine club and would tank a bottle of wine and wonder why she felt absolutely horrendous waking up on a on a Thursday morning, stumbling into work, having just woken up, breakfast at the desk, et cetera, et cetera. This is the thing, like I have been there. I have literally been in a position where, you know, you work a nine to five job, you're not happy with yourself and you're not happy with you know how you're living your life. But we're not asking women to say no to these things. What we are potentially asking you to do is to adjust the choices that you're making. So maybe you have a glass. You maybe don't stay for the third, fourth and fifth. You know, maybe you go out for dinner, but maybe you have the main and the dessert. Maybe you don't have the starter, the main, the dessert and the, the three cocktails that go with. It's all about finding that middle ground. The things that I would encourage people to say no to are the things that we know don't serve us. Look at your screen time to start with. That would be the first place I would start. You want to find more time in your week? Look at your screen time on your phone. Those things. So spending too much time around uh, technology, not being present, in your relationship. Hitting the snooze button five times in the morning. Staying up till 2 a.m. watching the next episode of Netflix. Impulse spending. All of these, none of these things actually make you feel great. Those are the kind of things that I would be suggesting you say no to. Things, social events or spending time with loved ones, those aren't to be removed, even if fat loss is the goal. Those are not to be removed. The choice and the decision making while in that situation, maybe we want to adjust to that. But I'm not saying don't do these things because this is why we do it. That's where the memories are made. Yeah, enjoyment has to be part of the process. And yeah, I love the idea of the middle way. The more I hear about the middle way, I'm like, that is the only way really because uh, if it's too much restriction and you can't have the things you enjoy, then there's no fun. And then if you're saying yes to too many things, then eventually um, the responsibilities you have, you won't get them done either. Um, what are kind of like some of the kind of core habits that like you typically uh, try to follow? with your clients is there any kind of like you know key habits that uh let's just say you know there's some women listening and they're kind of just like right i get the idea now you know what is there any practical habits that you typically focus on brilliant question um i believe i believe personally that structure is the backbone of everything and i believe that structure is where the magic happens. If you have either a solid structure or a set of principles to guide you and you can follow those and you can tick those off consistently, that's where really the magic happens. And for me, the first thing that I would be asking ladies to look at, and it's, you could say, well, Caroline, that's got absolutely nothing to do with fat loss. Start with your morning and your evening routine, genuinely. For me, my life changed the minute I became a morning person and I was not a morning person. Absolutely believe me. It was a, I literally used to get out of bed, probably snoozed for half an hour in the morning would roll out of bed, grab whatever was lying around, get to work. I'd have my breakfast at my desk at 10 past nine after coffee, chatting in the corner. The minute I decided to change that and become in control of my morning, it's not an exaggeration to say my life absolutely flipped. And that came out of necessity. Um, During the reason I, I brought in the morning routine was I simply did not have enough time in the day. I didn't have enough time. And I was looking at my day and thinking, right, I need to find more time here. And the only choice I had was to, was to get up that little bit earlier. And um, at that time, I was working at a nine to five job, but also doing the, the studying for the, the PT course. And there wasn't enough time to fit it in. So I took that time back in the morning and I set up and established a great routine. And it's one thing that I would suggest anyone, whether you have a fat loss goal or not, everyone nails a morning routine. It doesn't have to be extravagant. It doesn't have to be 20 minutes of meditation before absolutely nothing. It could be, I get up, I simply, I get up at this time. This is the time I get up, I have my coffee, I do X, Y, Z, now the day can start. What it looks like doesn't matter, it's how it makes you feel. And I've had numerous morning routines. It's a, it's a work in progress. It looks different in different seasons of my life. Um, but number one, nail the morning routine, nail the evening routine. If you get up and you go to sleep at consistent times, if those are fixed in your day, really, really, it gives you that structure. It gives you that, that, that push. 
And I do believe that when it comes to to working towards your goals specifically with women, there needs to be some degree of forward planning. You need to have some way of making sure that you have enough time. For me, I'm an absolute advocate of Google Calendar. My whole week is scheduled. Like it's literally, my clients know this. They all think I'm a raging psychopath. There is colored boxes for every single segment of the day. You're shaking your head. Like our business doesn't work if, can, if we're not organized. It simply doesn't. But your life doesn't work if you're not organized either. And, you know, does it always work the way that I'd like it to? You're only human and it's life. However, does it give me something to fall back on? Does it give me something to guide me through the day? So making sure that you are actually taking command of your day and your week is the number one for me. Before you even go into any realms of calorie tracking, map pros, workouts, nail the structure first, nail the routine. Yeah, that's so practical. Um, I'm just thinking of how a lot of recommendations I've heard for morning routines are like, this is the morning routine, or I almost get the idea, impression of the, the feeling that like the morning routine needs to be kind of like perfect, or you need to have it like seven days in a row or five days in a row. And I'm just thinking of my own like routine. It's like, it's a loose routine. Like if there's structure there, but it's like, I would say uh, the, the biggest benefit of it is basically that I don't have to think in the morning because I'm just not able to like think in the morning anyway. So can you just talk a little bit about like how a morning routine might like change or like you know how simple it it, it needs to be or, or has to be um get a benefit because I, I just see so many recommendations and they're just way too complicated so complicated people people love to overcomplicate things though that's my that's why every that's why a lot of people are stuck or they're not sure where to start when it comes to fat loss and reaching their goals because there is so much noise and the difficulty with noise is that it doesn't have any context so yes something might work for someone but it, it doesn't mean that it's applicable to you so i'll give you two two extremities When I, in lockdown, for example, when we had a lot of time, my morning routine, I kid you not, took two hours. My morning routine was like, it was a coffee. I read, it was half an hour of a book on, on mindset. And then it was half an hour of a book around business. And then it was an hour working on my own business. Like that was what my morning routine looked like. Then after that, I would go and I'd have my shower. I'd get dressed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now my morning routine is very much my alarm goes off. I have one of these, uh, one of these apps on my phone whereby the alarm, it wakes you up gradually. So it's like, a, it's like a gentle awakening. I absolutely despise that iPhone blaring. I find, I find it the most horrible way to start the day. It's, it's destructive. It's, gl- it's just awful. Um, I like calm in my life. I like calm in my morning. Um, so I get up, I do get up early and that alarm goes off between 4.45 and 5.15. So there is that, that spell. I have 15 minutes in which I I get up. My uh, my alarm is on the other side of the room, so I have to get up. Everything's laid out. So it's literally, again, it's exactly what you said. There's no thinking involved. It's the clothes are laid out on the floor. You just put them on. I take myself through. I have a cup of coffee. I sit at the breakfast bar and then I sit down at my laptop for five. That is as extreme as my morning routine is now. It's get up, put some clothes on, have a coffee, sit down. When I'm sitting at the breakfast bar, I'll have this, I'll have a liter of water and my supplements are sitting there. That's the morning routine. That's as difficult as it has. And my task list is already written from the night before. I sit down at my desk right here and I work. I do two hours of deep work in the morning. Then by that time, my dog decides to wake up. We do the we do the walk, we do the, the feeding, the this, that, and the next thing. And then we go to the gym. We go to them. I go. And, uh, and that's the way that the, the morning goes. I love that idea of the, the alarm, changing the alarm. I, <laughs> I'm reminded of the time on the, on the gym floor. I just, I never used the timer on my phone and I just used it one time randomly. The Apple, uh, generic, whatever phone it is. And me and one of the other trainers, when it went off, I, you know, just shocked. We just heard it and we we're just like, whoa, what, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> because awful. it was, we're conditioned, we were conditioned to have that like reaction. The best thing someone can do. I actually, it's so funny. I ordered one literally today. I haven't worn one forever. I ordered a new step tracker because a lot of the trackers have like a, a kind of like a vibrating alarm on them like a, so instead of waking up with noise you're waking up gently with that that feeling it will um gently wake you up rather than or you can do it with things like lumi lights which which gradually make the room brighter and try and um they mimic sunrise which is also a can be an effective way to to wake up we don't have as much sun as you do at this side of the so although i've been to san francisco once and it was just foggy the whole time yeah carl the fog he's uh yeah. you know he's been known to make his presence uh, felt. uh but yeah the, it's funny the morning routine it's like just mine is very similar just get up uh, get dressed and get straight to the, the laptop but i'm missing missing the task list i need to get that little extra uh optimization of the of the morning routine that's part of my evening routine 
So the part of the evening routine is, right, I set an alarm for 10 minutes before I'm due to finish the end of the day, before it's like closed off. And those 10 minutes are, right, what is the task list? And it's literally old school. It's nothing fancy. It's a piece of, it's a book next to my to my desk. And it means, like you say, that it removes decision fatigue. There's no decisions to be made in the morning. What should I be doing? And I make them tasks I like to do. So when you're first thing in the morning, like you're a little bit, mm. Um, I'd love to, sometimes I wake up all guns blazing, but not always. So I make it something that I enjoy doing in the morning. That's it. Yeah. If I have to make too many decisions in the morning, then it's just like, it's almost like I'm guaranteed to procrastinate. So just kind of on the flip side, let's just say you have a slow start in the morning or you snooze or you kind of just don't get off to the start you want, you know, as is, uh, you know, it can happen. What what do you typically recommend for clients when a situation like that arises? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a brilliant question because as you say, life happens. Now I mentioned the Google calendar earlier because my day is planned in terms of segments. What I simply do if something doesn't go to plan, dog ends up at the vet, someone's broken down on the road, like life, that thing called life. When that kids get sick all the time, that's when we get from clients is our oh, kids were sick or we had a bad night's sleep. You simply slot into the next slot of the Google calendar. So say for instance, something breaks down and you, you can't actually get to work till 11 a.m. Hypothetically, I would just slot right into my task for that 11 a.m. Okay, a few things got missed in the morning. It's not a deal breaker. Slot and carry on. It's all about that mentality. It's all about, okay, well, I'm not going to try and cram everything into it to my day now. I'm going to prioritize. I'm going to be rational. I'm going to take a little moment. I'm going to pause. I'm going to say, what's the essentials here? What if I could only complete one thing by the end of the day? What would I be happy with? Um, Gary Keller is the one thing. Um, one of my my coach actually has my version of it uh, just now. I recommended she read it. And the premise of the book is is very much if you could only achieve one thing on a given day, pinpoint what that is and nail that one thing. We're very, very, very good at spreading ourselves too thin and losing sight of what that real priority is. Yeah, kind of overwhelmed is like it's it'll hold you back so much. Yeah, trying to do too much. I think I'm definitely guilty of that. Um, and I think then leading on to my next question, so self talk. I think when you overwhelm yourself, it's very easy to get on your your case and be like, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. But if you don't prioritize, it just makes things uh, so difficult. So uh, the post. I'm referring to that you have is uh, fix your negative self-talk. So, you know, how can we improve our, our self-talk so that we like, instead of putting ourselves down, we actually like lift ourselves up? I know everyone is guilty of this. I think women in particular berate themselves and they're incredibly harsh on, on themselves. I think it's because you have high standards and you have a lot of things that you want to achieve. Your, you know, what you, your expectations of yourself are naturally higher. When it comes to self-talk, I always think it's staggering the way that we talk to ourselves versus how we talk to others. If we talked to friends the way that our internal dialogue goes on between our two ears, if we talked to our friends that way, we wouldn't have any friends. We have a level of compassion with other people that I think that we find very, very difficult to gift ourselves. And generally speaking, when I'm talking with clients about how to improve their self-talk and ways that they can practically, practically do that, the first step is to become aware of it and become aware of the tone that you're talking to yourself. How aggressive is it? Is it actually rational? Is what you're saying fact or fiction? Is this just a story you're telling yourself? But that awareness is absolutely, you have to observe and you have to become aware of what your self-talk is like. And very, very simply, once you've become aware and maybe you're sitting back and going, you know what? I'm not that nice to myself. I'm not really cutting myself any slack here. I'm being incredibly harsh. Try and reframe that. And I always say, literally visualize your best friend, the closest person that you have in your life. Even better, if you have a small child in your life, think about the way that you talk to them. And you would and even the tone of your voice changes. When you're talking to children, you don't talk to them in the same abrupt way that you, you might snap at your partner, for example. Yeah, we snap at kids, of course we do. But even the tone of voice changes. And we are really, really good at applying that to ourselves. So firstly, observe how is your internal monologue? What's what's the story there? What's the, what character do they play even? And then try and adjust that and think about how you would speak to a friend, child, if they came to you with the same problem similar problem. You probably wouldn't speak to your friend in that way. It's really interesting. Try it next time you feel yourself berating yourself for not having achieved something, missing a workout, you know, maybe staying for that extra glass of wine, hitting the snooze button. Next time you do something that you know isn't optimal in terms of reaching your goals, refer back to that and see if it works. Yeah, awareness is invaluable. I feel as though, uh, I think the best way to describe it is like we sometimes speak to ourselves like we're kind of robots. Like we should, we don't have feelings or that we just know what to do and we don't have distractions and uh, we're really just kind of like grown children in a way. You know, we still have that childlike aspect to us and we, you know, do respond to uh, encouragement. Um, and an example I'm thinking of, not 
observation I noticed on myself. So I ran a half marathon a couple of weeks ago and at mile nine, I like hit a wall and I was like, you blew it, you ruined it, you didn't prepare right. I was so, it was the most negative, you know? And luckily I was able to just kind of be like, yeah, let's just get it finished here and everything was fine. Um, and fast forward uh, to this week, I'm reading a book by uh, Christian Neff about, you know, the compassionate mind and just being more compassionate. And uh, same thing happened again on this run recently. I hit a wall again, but this time I was like, okay, so now I know what to do. I was like, just get it finished. You got this, you know, it's not at the end of the world. This is just like one run amongst many. And it was so different. And I, I say that because, you know, to be compassionate, it's kind of like, oh, it's corny, it's soft, or you need to be hard on yourself. And it's like, no, I, I experienced it. It works. But that awareness, like you said, it's just, that's the start. That's the start. Awareness is the start. Of, 100%. Yeah. I have so much respect for your running, by the way. I think running is such a mental game and one that I've never been able to wrap my head around. Yeah, running. Yeah, it's it's funny. Uh, it's I, If someone said like, you know, do you enjoy running? I would say absolutely not. I don't, don't enjoy it. But I enjoy the secondary benefits that come with it. So like, you know, the, the hardest part is the long run. And uh, I feel like the long runs, I look at it more like, uh, it's like I'm going on a, I'm, I'm spending like an hour to two hours, whatever it is, uh, with myself. So I'm going to, I'm going off into the woods with my mind. Um, and I listen to a podcast or I listen to music as well but a lot of it is it's kind of like a journey of self-discovery because it's kind of like what's underneath all the layers of like you know your mind I would say you know and uh, it's it's very interesting you know the kind of the journey you go on when you come to the end of the run and ideas or the self-talk or the experience that you go through uh, it's it's fascinating but it is very hard to get there and uh, I've only got to be able to do longer runs by doing shorter ones you know just baby steps so it does take a lot of time and it is if you're trying to do exercise you enjoy I can see how exercise uh, through running is not the obvious choice and yet because it challenged you more you will change more because you are challenged by by the not just the physical pursuit but that's forcing yourself pushing yourself into that discomfort and that's where you will get the most benefit i'd like to think so yeah like i'm definitely uh this will lead on to the next question i want to ask but i'm building moment with my kind of my fitness and my like my journey of fitness and just sort of like what i you know believe i can do you know so it's just kind of like um challenge you know and then the key thing is not to set too big of a challenge you know like it's I'm almost the challenge i set myself they're almost too easy but they need to be because it's kind of like uh it's, it's so easy to take on too much and then to hit a wall or fail or not, I won't say fail but to stumble and then get dejected and I'm really trying to avoid that I'm trying to encourage myself um so question motivation is it uh is a fact or is it fiction um and I meant and I asked that because I know momentum kind of like separate but maybe it's connected it just feels that feels very real whereas motivation it's kind of like you know sometimes you feel motivated sometimes you don't um so what are your thoughts around your posts um do you have on oh, motivation I've actually I have literally I've just recorded a podcast on this and I, I it will come out in the next few weeks. um motivation I think there is a misconception Perception in the fitness industry that motivation is not a real thing. People will say it's not motivation; it's discipline. Discipline is the thing that will carry you. Bullshit. Like, sorry, I, I call that that is not true. Um, I think that motivation is absolutely a thing. You cannot claim that some days you do not wake up in the morning and think I am more driven today to achieve X, Y, and Z more than other days. Of course, motivation is there. Do I believe it's fleeting? Yes, one hundred percent. And do I believe it's seasonal? Yes. The way that I like to think of motivation is is almost is a wave. Is like a is a wave. Sometimes it happens to be up. Sometimes it happens to dip. Do I think that that should change if you want to make long term progress? Do I think that that should change any of the actions that happen between it being up and down? No, not at all. The beauty is in the consistency in the middle. And whether you feel like it and whether you don't, that's where I believe is is the difference. The difficulty is that people will sit and sit and sit and wait. I think of motivation like a wave. I think others think of motivation like a lightning strike. So they're literally, they're sitting there and they're waiting for this elusive lightning strike to hit them. And when that happens, then they'll take action. That's taking that completely out of your own control. That's putting that in, you know, it, it simply doesn't work that way. Instead, I would think, imagine you're surfing, right? The way that I have never been surfing before, but I believe that this is what it, it looks like when you watch it on TV. I think of motivation like, you know, when you've got people paddling on their, their board. The motivation is that bit of power that makes you jump on the board. It's that one little bleep that makes you that you go it's short it's sharp there's loads of power behind it that's the motivation but where you get the results is how you then ride that wave and notice that the jumping on the board that's a very very short term thing very very fleeting very immediate the riding of the wave is the journey it's the long term progress that you're going to make it requires balance it requires consistency but that's where you get the most ground right that's where you travel the furthest um i don't believe that motivation is fiction i do believe it's fact however i don't think that 
that people use it in the right way. I think the minute that you detach and you realize that motivation is more within your control than you probably want to admit. I can tell you the things that make me feel more motivated. I can tell you the things that make me feel demotivated. Simply do more of the things that motivate you. Having great conversations, helping someone, exercising, moving your body, fueling your body adequately, showing up for yourself. You mentioned momentum there. Yeah, absolutely. If you show up for yourself and you continue to take action, it's like a it's like a hamster wheel. Like it just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. You're in control of that. If you don't feel motivated right now, if you're listening to this and you think, oh, I'll never be like that. I'll never jump out of bed and feel it. Yeah, but you can do something about that right now. You can take action right now. It doesn't have to be going to the gym necessarily. If I don't feel particularly motivated, sometimes I don't go to the gym. What I might do is grab my dog, go for a cup of coffee. I'll go and listen to a podcast of someone who I find really inspirational. Doing that, that small action will generally lead to something else, which will then lead to something else, which then might lead to that gym session. But it's all about the steps that you choose to take. And I think people do not take ownership of their motivation and it feels a bit bad cop to say it, but I think it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, they kind of make it too difficult. They feel like they need a lot of motiva- a lot of motivation. And it's, I think your, your motivation, like kind of like a wave, like it incrementally builds up, you know? And um, I'm just thinking of like the little things that like with my running, leaving out my shoes or what I'm going to wear, having the podcast that I'm going to listen to or the audio book that I'm going to listen to prepared. It's kind of like, uh, it's like a cake or something, the motivation cake, like where you just put in little ingredients and it just, after whatever, three hours, you know, there's the motivation the big surge of motivation but it's it's all the little things that go into it and that help build it up um, but Caroline we can probably talk for a few more hours I know uh, you're limited on time so thank you very much for uh, a really interesting chat um, is there anything you want to plug or that you want to uh, mention as a final message um, no just if anyone is interested I do have my own podcast it's called the, the Very Imaginative Coaching with Caroline The Extras you know it was only ever well it was only ever meant to be voice notes for clients so I found myself a year ago now, making the same voice notes for clients or having the same conversations over and over again. And I thought this is ridiculous. Turn this into, you know, put this somewhere where everyone can access, can access them. So the podcast was born, but the first, the first I don't know, the first 20 are literally just me chatting away um, to clients. And it's been something that I absolutely love doing. What are we on now? Episode 70, 70 something. Um, it is, I love, I love to chat. I love to have conversations. I love to, um, long format is my, my favorite way to to go into into things i think context is always key and uh, so yeah the podcast and instagram is at yeah, and i love that uh, aspect of-